Well, good morning, and uh, welcome once again to our study of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, I'm recording this on Friday morning, and as I look outside, the sun is shining, uh, the skies are nice and blue. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit cloudy here in my office this morning. There's just been some things that have happened this week that have been um, <clears throat> a little bit sad, if you will. Uh, I know we've had members of our congregation here who have experienced the passing of loved ones, and, and our prayers and condolences go out to the uh, Hale family. Uh, and just before I began recording this, uh, I got word that uh, one of my college roommates <clears throat> passed away yesterday with COVID. And so if you would please keep uh, the Norman family in your prayers. Uh, Greg Norman uh, was a very good friend of mine. Um, before we continue and go into the text of Luke chapter 6 this morning, let's just take a moment. Uh, of silent prayer, reflection, <clears throat> and asking God's grace and his, uh, his comfort uh, be with those who are dealing with uh, the loss of loved ones, uh, and, uh, and then we'll continue uh, our study together. So if you just join me for just a moment. Father, thank you for your presence in our lives <clears throat> and for the hope of eternity that each of us possesses because your son came into this world so that we, in, because of obedient faith to his love for us, we could spend eternity in yours. And Father, we pray blessings upon the hails. Uh, and we pray, Father, blessings upon the Burrises and the Normans and all those, Father, who have uh, just recently suffered the loss of <clears throat> a loved one. Uh, Father, bring peace, comfort, surround these families with your love. Keep the evil one away from them. It's times like this that he longs to be active. And so, Father, we pray for their, for their peace. And, Father, may we <clears throat> demonstrate to them our love, our affection, our concern, our care, uh, as we be for them what you would be if... Uh, you were here, and uh, may the spiritual body of Christ respond the way that Jesus in his physical body would have responded. Uh, I pray this in his name. <clears throat> Amen. Uh, as we're continuing our study, uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 6, and I want to look uh, this morning uh, at verses 1 through verse 16. Um, I'm grateful that David said that I didn't have to try to wrap up uh, our study of the book of Luke by the end of this month. Uh, that would have been our 13 weeks, uh, and he's given me uh, or allowed me uh, to spend a little longer in, in covering the text, and I'm grateful for that because I want to spend a little time this morning just focusing on two events uh, that we find uh, in this section of text. And so uh, verses 1 through 11, uh, my Bible calls it uh, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. In the beginning at verse 12, it is the calling of the 12 apostles. And I want to begin there. <clears throat> uh, and then I will go back to um, the first 11 verses and talking about Jesus' uh, two things that he does uh, that tells us some information about the Sabbath. But uh, I want to go up to verse 12 first. And so one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. The gospel writers include for us on multiple occasions the fact that this was a, this was a, a habit for Jesus that he would uh, distance himself from the crowds, that he would go to a solitary place, oftentimes overnight, and just spend time praying. And every time that we see that, it always uh, is followed by uh, a major event, uh, a major teaching, a major uh, healing, uh, or something this, of great significance uh, in the ministry of Jesus. And what follows this evening of prayer is Jesus calling from among all his disciples 12 men that will be tasked with the, the purpose of being an apostle, being one who sit forth on behalf of somebody else. Uh, and as they were going to be uh, the, um, the foundation for his church. And so on one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him, 
And he called and chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. The list of the twelve are only mentioned uh, four times uh, in Matthew chapter 10, Mark chapter 3, here in Luke chapter 6, and once again in Acts chapter 1. Of course, in that list, Judas' name is not mentioned because we know what happens uh, just immediately preceding, uh, following his betrayal of Jesus. Um, it's interesting that if you look at these lists, uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John are always listed first uh, in that first group. Uh, and then that's followed by uh, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew. Now, their names are always in that same order, uh, but uh, that's the next group. And then it always concludes uh, in the three gospel accounts with Judas Iscariot. Uh, just a couple of things that we we need to know or find interesting, at least for me, uh, is one is called Simon the Zealot. Now, we do not know if that is just an adjective describing his zeal that he had or if it's an official uh, membership in what we know as that group of patriots uh, who wanted to overthrow the Roman occupation, who went to war with Rome, and because of that particular war, brought about uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Uh, if he is actually a zealot, uh, one of that particular group, uh, I find it interesting uh, that we know that Matthew, by profession, uh, is a tax collector. The tax collectors were considered, if you were part of our class uh, last week or on our, our Sunday morning service, uh, tax collectors were considered some of the lowest of the low. They were traitors. Uh, they were uh, thieves, they were liars, they were uh, uh, evil, if you will. And they were the primary targets, one of the primary targets of the zealots, because they were traitors who worked for the, for the Roman government. And so you had Matthew, the tax collector, and you had Simon, uh, the zealot, if indeed this is referring to as a, uh, a title, not just an adjective. Uh, and can you imagine the very first... Um, pitch in, if you will, when they're together and they're going, hi, what you know, well, I'm Matthew, really, well, I'm Simon, well, what do you do, uh, Matthew, well, I'm a tax collector, oh, really, I'm a zealot, uh, could have been a little bit uncomfortable, but I think the beautiful thing is, if indeed, if indeed, uh, we're speculating that that is part of the story, uh, that Jesus takes people who, on their own, would not be connected, would not associate experienced animosity, and yet because of a common faith in God, a common belief in the ministry of Jesus, a common acceptance by uh, God's saving grace and redemption, that in spite of their differences, that they could work together, be together, accomplish together God's purpose. Uh, the other one is Judas Iscariot. We all know who Judas is. He's the betrayer. The text even here refers to him as that. Luke gives us that, or at least gives to Theophilus, uh, that uh, description of who he is. The word Iscariot, we're really not quite sure what that means. Most likely, uh, it is Ish, which means man, and Kirioth, which means the man from Kirioth. Kirioth was in uh, Judea. All the rest of the apostles are from Galilee. And I wonder if part of um, Judas's attitude or Judas's feelings was the fact that he was maybe, maybe an outsider. Um, but it's important that Jesus calls these 12 and that from this point forward, these are the ones whose attention we're going to see, particularly that first group of four and even more specific, that inner circle of three of um, Peter, James, and John. At this particular point, Jesus is now bringing in and starting to be more clear about his purpose of establishing a kingdom that's different than what they expected. Now, back to verses 1 through 11. And the reason why I want to go, I wanted to, to do them in this order is because this is where I want to spend some time together. It's important for us to understand what the Sabbath is. 
and we know that Jesus is going to be in trouble already for healing on the Sabbath. There will be two events mentioned here uh, that take place on the Sabbath uh, that's going to either begin or further heighten the opposition and the persecution that Jesus is going to face uh, from the religious leaders of his time. From his, of his time. Uh, the Sabbath was a day designated by God, given to the children of Israel as part of the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment, saying that um, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For it was according to Exodus's account, for this is the day that God rested from his labors. Now, if you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning at verse 12 through about verse 15, uh, Moses repeats the Ten Commandments, but here he gives us a little different spin or a little different take on it. Because what he says here is it gives us some indication as to um, maybe the real purpose or reason uh, that God gave uh, the Sabbath to man. And, and he says, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons or daughters, nor your male or female servants, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Verse 15, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. And I think what we see here is some indication of uh, what the Sabbath's purpose was. It was to be a, a reminder of the release from those things that enslave us, that burden us, that hold us back and hold us down. He says, so I, I want you to take a day of rest. I rested on the seventh day. I want you to take a day of rest so that neither you nor any of your family or any of your servants or any visitors or foreigners or strangers or even up to your livestock that they don't do anything that burdens them and I want this to be a reminder to you of the fact that I'm giving you this day so that you can reflect on the on the on the fact that I have been the one who has released you I, I think that's the reason why uh, Deuteronomy uh, tells us in chapter 5 uh, this reminder that I am the one who brought you out of Egypt and connects that deliverance to the keeping of the Sabbath day uh, and its purpose. It was to be a day of relief, a day of rest, a day of releasing, if you will. Which is, I think, one of the reasons why we're going to see as we read these two incidences of, of Jesus dealing with the Pharisees on Sabbath issues. Uh, that Jesus stresses, particularly in the second story, addresses the fact that they have forgotten what the purpose of the Sabbath was. Now, we know that on the Sabbath day, the basic is, is you're not supposed to work. Where the question came is, okay, who gets to define what work is? And so what they did is, in order to keep from breaking the law, they weren't really that concerned about keeping the law. They just didn't want to break the law. As a matter of fact, they were so, in Jesus' day, the rabbis taught uh, that if it was possible, for the nation of Israel to perfectly keep the Sabbath, it would usher in the Messiah. And so I can see why uh, the Pharisees were so uh, adamant about Jesus not doing what he was doing on the Sabbath. Because in their mind, that if it would, if he was jeopardizing the nation, if you will, uh, because of the fact that um, he was keeping the Messiah from coming, even though he himself was indeed the Messiah. Uh, the first um, encounter in, we find in verses 1 through verse 5. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pluck some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, taking the consecrated bread. He ate what is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. And then Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. What upset the Pharisees is they broke three or four, or maybe even five different rules regarding the Sabbath. 
Now, what they did is they broke down work into 39 categories. Carrying, burning, extinguishing, finishing, writing, erasing, cooking, washing, sewing, tearing, knotting, untying, shaping, plowing, planting, reaping, harvesting, threshing, winnowing, selecting, sifting, grinding, kneading, combing, spinning, dyeing, chain stitching, warping, weaving, unraveling, building, demolishing, trapping, shearing, slaughtering, skinning, tanning, smoothing, and marking. And then they broke each of those down. Uh, so, for example, um, they weren't allowed to plow. Plow was working. So in Jesus' day, because of dirt floors, they were then also restricted from even rearranging the furniture in their house because dragging that chair across the dirt floor was putting a crease in the floor. That was plowing. That was work. That was, that was wrong. And so what Jesus' disciples here are guilty of is they're harvesting, they're winnowing, they're preparing food to be eaten. All three things that you weren't allowed to do on the Sabbath day and the Pharisees are going, wait a minute, you're breaking all the rules. Jesus' response is interesting. Jesus doesn't disagree with them that they have been eating grain from a field, etc. What Jesus does is he goes back to a story found in 1 Samuel chapter 21. David and his men are on a mission from God, and they come and they are starving to death. And so they go into the tabernacle and they take the show bread or the consecrated bread, 12 loaves of bread that were put on the table that once a week were changed out with fresh loaves. And that bread was then to be eaten only by the priests. David and his men aren't priests. So therefore it was unlawful for them to eat it. But what Jesus is doing, I think, is a couple of things. There is no way in the world that these religious leaders were going to condemn the great King David for violating anything, uh, breaking any rules, for anything that was unlawful. And so what Jesus is saying is we have to be consistent. And then he makes this statement. And the statement is, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And what is interesting is what Jesus here is basically telling the Pharisees, and it does not go uh, without uh, them catching it or noticing it. He's just saying, I'm the one who created the Sabbath. I'm the one who rested from my labors. On the seventh day, I'm the one who gave the commandment to your ancestors. And because I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, I can do on the Sabbath what I think is best. Luke records a second one then. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely. To see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Now, there's a couple of things you need to remember. The Pharisees knew on the Sabbath where Jesus would be. So they knew that he was going to be uh, in the synagogue. Now, whether this man was a plant by the Pharisees just to test and see what Jesus would do or whatever, we don't know. We just know that when they saw the man, or recognized the man, knew that there was a man there that needed to be healing, that Jesus was present, they were just waiting to see if Jesus would indeed violate the Sabbath. Now, it's interesting, later on, um, the leaders of the synagogue will tell them, there's six other days you could be working. Go get healed on those days. Just don't do it on the Sabbath. And I'm not saying that Jesus purposely antagonized the Pharisees, but I think Jesus wanted to make another point. The point that he made with the, the disciples uh, harvesting grain uh, on the Sabbath was that I'm in charge of the Sabbath. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. But here is something different. Uh, beginning again at verse 8, But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. I think Jesus didn't want anybody to miss what was taking place. And so he got up and he stood there. <clears throat> and then Jesus said to them, I ask you which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy it. Then he looked around at them all, and then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Jesus here, in, in the first um, episode, Jesus wants to, them to understand that he's the Lord of the Sabbath, that he is the one who instigated it. He's the one who is uh, God. In this second one, I think what he wants them to focus on is when he says, 
I want to ask you a question. What is lawful? And he uses that important word. What is lawful on the Sabbath? What is truly part of what God has told you and has provided for you? Not your rules and regulations and all that stuff that the Talmud uh, that you guys have created. What does he say? Is it better to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to destroy it? Now, I find it interesting uh, in Mark chapter 2, uh, in verse 27, when he records Mark's account of this instance, he adds this, um, that um, uh, the Sabbath was meant for uh uh, the Sabbath is meant for man, not man for the Sabbath. Uh, and what he meant by that is the purpose of the Sabbath, back to what Deuteronomy is referring to, was always to be a blessing and not a burden. And what the Pharisees had done is taken that which God intended for our good and made it a burden difficult to bear. Uh, we need to be very careful. Here's a, an assigned lesson, I think, for us, that we do not take the things of God and because of what we add to it or sometimes take away from and make it more difficult for people to understand the love that God has for them, what it means to be his child. What kind of life does God want us to live? Uh, I find it interesting. God starts out with the Ten Commandments, goes to the Nine Beatitudes, goes to the Eight Fruits of the Spirit, and then sums it down into two. Let's boil it all down. When asked what the greatest commandment was, Jesus says, love God, love others. That's When you put those two into place, that will cover everything else that all of the law that Moses gave and all the prophets' teachings uh, reside in, find their fulfillment in these two things. And so what Jesus is saying is, you have <clears throat> you've become a burden on man with that which God intended to be good. He says, so what, what, what's better? What is lawful to do good, to heal this man who is in bondage to his uh, affirmity, or to do evil? What is better to... to um, save a life, or to destroy it. Now, any of these, if one of their sheep was um, in danger, would rescue that sheep on the Sabbath. Is this man created in the image of God not of more value, more important to God, and should be to you? And so what Jesus here is doing is I think is a couple of things. First of all, he wants them to understand, and us in turn, as he's writing this to the office, that God is in charge. That God is the one who loves his people so much that what he has required of us is not to be a burden, is not to go, oh, woe is me, that our Christian life is not something to be endured, uh, but rather to be enjoyed. And so this, the commandment of keeping the Sabbath day was to be a, uh, a joyous occasion, a day that you were able to, to rest and to relax and to be released from whatever it was that burdened and enslaved you. And instead, it was taken out of out of maybe initially some proper motives that they didn't want to break the law. But instead of breaking the law, they put a fence around it and said, we just don't, we don't want to keep it, but we just don't want to break it. And so they came up with all these rules. And God says, that wasn't my purpose. My, my desire for your life is not for it to become a burden. My desire for your life is for it to become a blessing. Which I think, brothers and sisters, as an aside note, makes it very interesting. When we talk with and, and uh, share our faith with people who ask us, are you certain you're going to heaven? Because there's so many in this world that teach, I know I'm going to heaven. I, matter of fact, somebody says, once I'm going, I can't do anything to stop myself from being able to go to heaven. When we're not certain, when we're unsure, well, maybe I might, you know, I, you know, if, if there's a crack in the back door, I might, no, 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 no. I believe in eternal security, not because of anything that I've done, but because of everything that God has promised. And I believe I have a home prepared for me. And if we tell people, come believe in this God that we believe in and believe in his son and obey the things that his son has told us. Uh, that are a demonstration of our love for him. <clears throat> but are you certain it's, it's going to pay off in the end? Well, we're not. why add another burden to somebody? And that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. They were turning that which was meant to be for their blessing and their benefit, and they turned it into a burden. <sighs> the Sabbath, given to us as a blessing by God. Don't turn the blessings of God into a burden for ourselves, 
for each other. Um, next week, I want to get into beginning at verse 17, which is uh, Luke's account of the, the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, yes, it's very similar to what we find in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Some discussion, is this just a paraphrased version, um, or is it a, a second occurrence? Well, it has to be a second occurrence because it's on the plain, not a mountain. Well, the word plain there means plateau or a level spot in a mountain range, so it could be the same. But it doesn't have to be. Anything as important as what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm pretty sure he didn't uh, limit it to, to just one explanation, that it was something he continued to remind his disciples of. Hope you have a good week. I hope you have a great Sunday. I look forward to seeing you if you're going to be able to join us in person. If not, um, God's blessings, God's peace and comfort on you uh, in your time of hurting, your time of struggle, uh, in your time of anxiety. Uh, trust in God and knowing that he's in charge. Love you. Hope to see you soon. And God bless.